In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Rejection hits hard. We've all felt the sting of being cast off, excluded from teams, excluded from groups, or pushed away even by people. And because of it, or maybe but because of it, we've all learned something of mercy along the way. The man who ends his relationship with his girlfriend doesn't usually do it over the phone or with a text message with a quick, nice knowing you, good riddance. Typically, he'll soften his rejection by saying, it's not you, it's me. The general manager normally doesn't call the pitching coach into his office and say, collect your things, you're fired. He'll tell him, look, you're a great coach, but we've decided to take the ball club in a different direction. Or the human resources manager will never tell an applicant that she's not good enough to have a job there, but will perhaps soften up the rejection, saying, well, we've decided to give the position to another candidate. Or don't call us, we'll call you. Now, in situations like these, the hiring and firing of personnel, the ending of a courtship, and so on, it's good to be tactful, it's good to be sensitive, we don't always need to go for the jugular, but oftentimes our desire not to offend someone or not hurt their feelings ends up with us soft-pedaling the issue and leaving things unsaid that should have been said. God be praised, our Heavenly Father doesn't deal with us the way that we often deal with one another. God isn't afraid of us. He isn't afraid to hurt our feelings. He isn't afraid to tell us the truth about our condition. He isn't afraid to discipline us as His children, even if that means leaving a bright red handprint on our rear ends. And I promise you, God does not care about what triggers you or what microaggressions you may have. The holy law of God does not soft pedal. It is ruthless, it's harsh in its condemnation of man, and it has no softening language. God's Ten Commandments are like an iron fist with no velvet glove. And those ten words from those stone tablets say to every man, it's not me, it's you. Those ten words say to every man, of course, yes, it's personal, you're the problem. Those ten words are the basis for God to say to every man, you are unclean, and therefore I cast you out, out of the garden. You aren't worthy to gain access to the kingdom of God. And God places all of us in the same category, unclean, reject, if you will just like one of the favorite groups of rejects in the Gospels, the lepers. This is what the holy law of God, given through His servant Moses, had to say, had to prescribe for the leprous. The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothes and let the hair of his head hang loose, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. It's interesting, covering up his upper lip and shouting unclean. Masks all the way back then. Lepers were forced to live beyond the city gates, cut off from their communities, their family, their friends. Worst of all, cut off from the holy presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this morning we heard of an encounter Jesus had with some lepers as He journeyed toward Jerusalem. Now, we're not told that it's merely a group of lepers or just some crowd of lepers that happen to be outside. We're actually given a specific number. And don't let that be lost on you. There were ten lepers. That's no accident. That's a chilling reminder of where the holy law of God places all of us, unclean, 
beyond the gates of the kingdom of God, rejected, rejected from fellowship with God. But today a good thing happened for lepers. Today a good thing happened for rejects. A prophet arrived on the scene. Now you might think that what a leopard needs, a leper needs more than anything, more than a prophet, would be a doctor. But in the scriptures, it's better to have a prophet around. Miriam was afflicted with leprosy, but she had the prophet Moses there to heal her. Naaman, the commander of the Syrian army, also had leprosy, but he had the prophet Elisha to heal him. And these ten lepers had the best sight of all. A prophet like Moses, like Elisha, but better. A prophet who was God in the flesh with ten fingers and ten toes, ready to do what those ten commandments could never do, and that was have mercy on man. And he did. Jesus saw them. And don't let that detail pass you by, because before he spoke, our Lord saw those lepers, those lepers who had been banished from the sight of everyone else, Jesus journeyed toward them and lifted up his countenance upon them. He saw them. He had compassion on them. And then he spoke, go and show yourselves to the priests. That's what this good prophet said. And when they went, they were cleansed. But only one of them went to the right priest. The one who is not only the great prophet, but the one who is also the great high priest, our Lord Jesus Christ. The other nine went off to priests who could only stand in the temple and, and, and examine the skin of lepers. The other nine went off to priests who could only stand in the temple and offer animal sacrifices, give instructions, pronounce that one was clean, but could not speak the word that would affect the cleansing itself. The Samaritan, he went to the right high priest. He had faith, and that made him a good Samaritan. By faith in Jesus, that leper became the good Samaritan in Luke's gospel that no one ever talks about. Last week you heard about the good Samaritan that even the world loves that even the world names hospitals after. Interestingly, Jesus never calls the Samaritan in his parable good. That's just what we call him. We call him the good Samaritan. What Jesus calls him, or what Jesus says of him, is who is the one who proved neighbor to the man left for dead in the ditch? So if anything, Jesus calls him a good neighbor. He's the one who did something, the active one, the one who got down in the dirt, the one who helped the man beaten and left for dead on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, the one who paid for the hospital stay and then promised to return three days later. You go, well, that, that passage didn't say anything about Jesus returning three days later. Well, he gave the keeper of the inn two denarii, two days' wages, and then promised to come back to pay for the rest. The implication is that he would be back on the third day. Today we hear of another good Samaritan. Another one who gets face down in the dirt at Jesus' feet and does nothing. He only receives. And the leper's faith saved him. You see, that's what the Greek actually says. Rise, go on your way. Your faith has saved you. Not your faith has made you well which you heard and which you read in your, in your English Bibles. Your faith has saved you because he received more than mere healing of his body. He was justified. He was declared righteous. He was credited with the goodness of Jesus. His faith saved him. But after this, something even better happened for lepers and rejects like us. Jesus fulfilled his own command to go and show yourselves to the priests even though it would cost him his life. But he went to do just that. His great love for condemned and outcast man compelled our good prophet, 
our good high priest to go to Jerusalem in order to be reckoned a leper for our sake. That's what he came for. He went to be rejected like a leper. He went to be despised like a leper. He went to trade places with us, not only with those ten, but also with us. There went God in human flesh to show himself to the priests and elders and be falsely accused and condemned so that we might be accepted, so that we would be allowed back in. And there he went to the cross bearing the curse of the law so that we might be redeemed from our law-breaking. There he went, the law's rejection of man hitting him hard, his skin bruised, bloodied, beaten beyond recognition, looking on the cross quite like a disfigured leper so that the Father would deal kindly with us. There he went, the law's rejection of us hitting Jesus hard so that God might speak softly to us words of absolution. There he went to the cross, presenting himself to the Father as the most defiled sinner ever, so that you, his church, his bride, might be presented to the Father in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And only then could he rise from the dead in triumph, only then could our great leper go on and show mercy on another, another group of ten who sorely needed it. That first Easter evening, those ten, those ten disciples, those ten deniers, those ten cowards, living in isolation behind locked doors, guilty, afraid, thinking that they were excluded and rejected from God's love forever, just like these ten lepers did. And so Jesus showed himself to them too. For he did not reject them as ten enemies, but approached them as ten friends, his blood having made them ten royal priests to his God and Father. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Look at my side, he said like a leper waiting to be examined. And they were glad when they saw the Lord. And they were glad when they saw the wounds that He still bore in His flesh. Because by those wounds they were healed. By them they were saved. And they knew that they had God's eternal approval. God dealt graciously with those ten lepers. He dealt graciously with His disciples after He rose from the dead. And He deals graciously with you. His being despised like a leopard, a leper has made you his holy priesthood. You're no longer outcasts. You need not live like those lepers of old who had to cover their faces, who had to announce their uncleanness and shout for mercy from a distance. You get to draw near. You get to come in because your good leper has drawn near to you. He has made the journey to you, and you receive His mercy right in your mouth. It's personal. It renders you good enough to inherit His eternal kingdom. So come, because here He presents to you the flesh and blood that purifies you from the inside out. Here is the flesh and blood that cleanses you from all sin, that fills you with the fruit of the Spirit and gives you access to God's holy presence. And having received that body and blood, hear him speak those same words to you. Rise and go your way. Your faith has saved you. In Jesus' name.